Welcome to our Love to Tell the Story podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And I'm Christopher Fan Kaufman. And this is a podcast for a summer preaching series uh, on 1 John. And we are uh, very fortunate that we have the author of the common of the of the commentaries uh, on the website. Christopher Van Kaufman is one of our podcasters here, as you've already heard. So, Christopher, uh, give us an overview of the of the series before we talk about uh, each uh, reading. Yeah, no, happy to be here. I also want to point out that one of the wonders of working preacher is that there are a multitude of resources available. So there's also an excellent commentary by Dr. Janet Oak from Fuller Seminary that you can read alongside the one that I've produced. So I highly encourage you to do so. It's always good to get multiple voices, including this podcast, as you do your sermon prep. The thing that I focus on in my commentary on 1 John that I hope that you'll find interesting is the way in which the letter of 1 John is in some ways kind of preaching application in action, in that we see a lot of the messaging and the themes from the Gospel of John put into play in terms of the life of a congregation. And so 1 John is written to a community which has is going through some struggles. It's un, a little bit unclear what those struggles are. They're only alluded to, not explicitly mentioned. But the writer of the letter who is known to them and who seems to be a trusted figure among them is, as I said, drawing on these themes and these lessons from the Gospel of John, is trying to help them understand what it means for them to live together. And I like to think of the letter of 1 John not in terms of a through narrative, that is like a straight line narrative, but instead circling around themes and building up on themes week over week. And so I think as you see, as you read through the letter, you'll see that the same things, same themes, excuse me, continue to be repeated, but with variations that show off different sides of the issues that this community is facing. Joy, any overview comments before we jump in maybe to week one? Um, When we're talking about these themes, I uh, always like to, I I guess I'm probably going to be more in tune with going uh, deeper in. Uh, I really appreciate this overview and recognizing that it sounds more like a sermon um, uh, than a letter. Um, And the resonance that it has uh, with uh, particularly uh, what we read in the Gospels and particularly what we read uh, in the Gospel of John. Um, But there are some, some language in here that we'll get into as we speak about the uh, particular verses that I think I'd like to dive into more. All right. Um, So the first week is John 1, 1, all the way through 2, 2. So it's, uh, the chapter's not super long, but it's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a long reading. Um, What jumps out at you, uh, Christopher? You say it begins with a bang in the commentary. Yeah, one of the things that the author reflects on right away, and I think this is interesting, again, in terms of thinking about the relationship that they are trying to build with the, this community, is the way in which they ground their teaching in the whole of God's story, specifically in God's story in Jesus Christ, with this uh, reference to the first things, that is the beginning of Jesus's ministry. But then also, again, alluding to the Gospel of John and the way in which the Gospel of John at the beginning takes us into the story of all creation. Everybody is familiar with that famous, in the beginning was the word. The way that Jesus, not just in his earthly life, but Jesus as part of the creative process of God is there through the, at the very beginning of time. And so with that illusion, this is what I mean by beginning with a bang. The author of 1 John really wants the, this community to think back on the way that God has been active in their lives, in the ministry of Jesus, and throughout all of creation. It seems to me um, that there are so many resonances between 1 John 1 and John 1. The, the, word, the beginning, um, of mm-hmm. course, what we have seen with our eyes, that whole piece that... Uh, resonates with John, the word of life. And, you know, the, in the beginning was the word. Um, but that it's, 
light and darkness, the theme of light. Yeah. What else am I missing? Um, the, um, but then it goes to a place where I don't remember this word being uh, in John one, but I, I could be wrong. So it goes, but you know, it, it goes through that sort of uh, that nice um, liturgical ring. And then it says, says, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And the, truly our fellowship is with the father and the son that koinonia Gerhard Ferdi of beloved memory once said of the typical Luther seminary graduate, they only learned one word of Greek koinonia. Now I need to go check my zip codes because I think there is this idea of um, we're writing these things. I, I'm, I'm going to the fourth verse or the next verse there. We're writing these things that our joy may be complete. I believe there is a, a ring to that in, in John. Um, uh, I think it, it, it comes out more of abundant than complete. Yeah, the abundant life. But yeah. I was wondering about that. Yeah, but it, for me, it. it ring that echoes for me from from John um, in this idea that um, uh, we're we're receiving a promise. John uh, is reminding us, as as uh, Christopher is so clearly um, laid out. First uh, John reminds us that this is the work of God from the beginning, as does. Um, uh, the Gospel of John, but this echo for me is what is this life? And this life, this um, is is broken relationship. We'll get into this more, but it's broken relationship with God and broken relationship with one another. And from the very beginning, what's the first time that we see this brokenness? Well, it's when humanity decides to um, um, seek more than God has promised, to doubt that being created in the image of God is God-like enough. And what is broken is not just disobeying God in the relationship with God, but immediately the fellowship with one another. They began to blame one another. And the whole promise is the restoration of that relationship, of that fellowship, and I would say the completeness of joy is when we can be our full selves with one another and not be ashamed. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think that speaks to what they're trying to get at when they talk about fellowship and what it means to be in fellowship with one another. To your question, Ralph, the word for koinonia does not occur in any of the Gospels, if I remember correctly. It's a very characteristically Pauline word. Paul uses it quite often in his letters. And I think it, it may occur in Acts once, but I'd have to I'd have to look that up. But the point being, it, it makes a lot of sense that as we get into these letters that are dealing with Christian communities, as opposed to the narrative of the life of Jesus, we now have the authors of these letters turning to the question: What does it mean to live in fellowship with one another? What does it mean to have a community, even? And so it, it's not surprising to me in that sense that they're making that change in some ways or that switch in topic from the narrative of the life of Jesus to the actual working out of that life within this particular community. I'm going to, um, uh, in a nod to uh, my dear Methodist colleague, Joy, I'm going to quote an old Methodist. I think I think he was a Methodist. Uh, I think what this saying um, captures um, uh the concept of fellowship here, that we have fellowship with each other because we have fellowship with the Father, Son, and Spirit. And that is, uh, was it, um, I just forgot, Stanley, was it Jones? Uh, Joy, the old, um, anyway, Stanley, everyone. He, he's Stanley Jones? Yes. Yes, the he's Stanley Jones. Yes. Um, everyone who belongs to Jesus Christ belongs to everyone who belongs to Jesus Christ. Yes. And I, he, he, Stanley Jones had a way of turning a phrase uh, mm -hmm. that far surpasses that passes, uh, almost anyone I've ever known. And I, I think that really captures what it is to be in Koinonia. I found the text from John 15 that this echoed in my imagination. It's John 15, and uh, it's um, 
uh, around verse uh, 11, I have said these things to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move on to week two, which is 1 John chapter 3, 1 through 7. What jumps out at you uh, today, Christopher? One of the things that we're going to see throughout 1 John and that I encourage you to think about within your own context, because these are issues that you will see all the time, are the issues of how sin, both with a capital S and with a small s, impact Christian communities and the role that love plays in mending those impacts. And this is something that John is going to come at from a number of different angles. And one of the ways that he comes at it here is through openly acknowledging the in-between nature of the Christian community, that it has been called and sanctified by God through the Holy Spirit, and yet it still remains in the human condition wherein people hurt each other and the community is broken despite it being called by God. And so I think that this is a powerful text because it acknowledges that reality and speaks into the fact that this is something that Christian communities, as we can see here, even from the very beginning, have faced. It's a good reminder that the the fellowship of Christians is the fellowship of the forgiven. And that in, in the first week, you know, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God was faithful and just, we'll forgive our sins. We used to say that when I was a pastor, a parish pastor, every week we had the confession of sins, which I deeply miss. And uh, replacing it with Thanksgiving for baptism is like getting kissed over the phone. I'd much rather be forgiven. Oh, whew. okay. Talk about turns of phrases there, sir. <laughs> Sorry. That that was a okay. I get that. Um, I I'm I I'm drawn to the fact that we should be called children of God. Um, I'm drawn to um, what it means to be um, brought into the family, um, and uh, in in the idea that you were talking about, uh, Christopher of the not yetness. Um, the family can be pretty messed up, um, but you know we're connected. And the difficulty of the imperfections of the family, along with the um, beauty of what it means to belong, um, is that not yetness that we are residing in right now. And so the one whom we have um, actually always sinned against, the one who we have stepped out of relationship with, the creator God, is the one, Ralph, who gives us this forgiveness. And that forgiveness is that despite our unfaithfulness, God still calls us those who belong in God's family. Shall we move to week three? I believe we should. First John 3, 16 through 24. And, uh, the, the same person who taught me, E. Stanley Jones, my early bishop and childhood pastor, Lowell Erdahl, who always quoted E. Stanley Jones, he, al he also loved to say, we are a church of John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not die but have eternal life. And he would say, we are a church of 1 John 3.16. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another that uh, the response of the Christian life to the love of Christ. I like it. You like I it? The, I do. I do. I think, though, that one of the things that I think just jumps out at me in this passage is that one of the things that sometimes troubles readers of First John mm. is, especially Lutheran readers of First John, is it has a lot of emphasis on what we do what it means to not sin, what it means to live with one another. And you get all of this, this these commands against not sinning, even in the beginning. And then you get to this really interesting, in 1 John 3.23, 
reformulation of the commandments of God. And John is good at this. The Gospel of John does the same thing, where it sets up an expectation and then flips it around on you. And this here, and this is his commandment. And so commandment, we're thinking law language, we're thinking love, we're thinking, and all of a sudden, this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And the way in which John, while focused on sin and focused on the harm of sin to the community, also understands that the solution to sin is belief in the name of Jesus, not in trying harder not to sin. And I think that this is a really beautiful kind of rhetorical setup that gets to that point. And, and that, I was going to say that fits back with what we were talking about last week's uh, uh, text in the sense that um, we're never going to get it. Um, and that's God's grace, is that God, God never intended for us to get it on our own. God has always walked beside us, even when we've turned our back on God. And what we learn in Jesus is that God desires to walk with us, to be with us, to recover for us um, the knowledge, the full knowledge of who God is. And we see that in Jesus Christ. I want to ask a really nerdy question, Christopher. Do you have your Greek available? I of, do. Of that verse that you were talking about? Because my heart always burns within me when Christopher opens the scriptures to me while exegeting the Greek. Christopher, it says, this is his commandment. And then it goes into Hina, which I could never, ever learn. And, and my Greek teacher would almost laugh at me back in college when I couldn't get the difference between a purpose clause and a result clause. But mm. it's, it's strange. Usually I would expect something like, this is his commandment, hoti, that. We must, but we're getting here hina, and then like it looks like some sort of subjunctive or, or cohortative. I'm not sure what I'm looking at. Mm-hmm. Wow, we're going to get deep in the weeds here. Go for yeah. it. So this is an, it's an aorist subjunctive, and so we are in the subjunctive, which is for those of you who took Spanish and French, you might remember this. It's the tense or the mood that you use when you want to talk about things that perhaps are not quite yet. We sometimes talk about it as the should, would, could way of speaking, that we in English add should, would, could, and other languages use what's called the subjunctive. The interesting thing about Hina is that Hina starts to lose its specificity in the Koine period. So we have another Greek word, hoti, that's often used to uh, introduce clauses like purpose clauses and result clauses. And we have another word, hoste, which is used exclusively to introduce result clauses. And in the Koine period, they all start to get together. And so we have this problem where when we get a Hina, I don't think that you are wrong to be confused, in that it's sometimes hard to know what's going on. In this particular case, though, because the first part of the, of the sentence, this is the commandment, is a statement of fact, not like part of an if-then statement or something like that. This is probably just what we call simple hina, that it's introducing a new phrase, in this case, in the subjunctive. So this is his commandment, almost like acting like a colon. This is his commandment equals that we might believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. That's how I would understand Thank you. There. Thank you. I really appreciate Thanks, thanks for uh, and all. Thank you, listeners, for also um, entertaining uh, my uh, confusion. Uh, but but I do think it's helpful. Last thing, I know we're going long on this, but the word believe, pistuo, um, as a noun, we usually translate it faith. But and they they have a nominal and verbal form of the same root, but we don't in English. Mm -hmm. We don't have a verbal form of faith. Um, to go with this, so we, then we use believe. Uh, what's uh, give? A, what's the sense of this? Is this trust? It, is it more trust or is it more cognition? 
Yeah, so Pistuo, I like to tell my students that this is a client patron language. That is, this is the language that you use when you talk about the trust that a client think about like a patron of the arts, somebody who sponsors an artist. And the artist has trust that if they do their painting, the patron of their painting will take care of them. Not simply because they're performing a useful service, like a plumber or something like that, but out of their beneficence. This is that same language that this to have faith in, to trust in, means that you can count on this person to do good by you and do good for you. And this is what that language is about. It's not belief in the sense of uh, to believe what you're saying. It's belief mm -hmm. in the sense of trusting that this person will do good for you. And that becomes incredibly important as a way of interpreting this because it goes back to the echoes of what was the problem uh, at the fall. And it was not confidence that God would do what God had promised to do, that it was not believing, not trusting that being made in the image of God was God-like enough. And so I really appreciate, uh, Rolf, you asking this question to let us go into uh, that nerdy kind of uh, definition, because it really takes it away from some of the disagreements that we have uh, today with one another and turns it back to a total focus on what do you think God is doing in all of this? Thanks. Uh, let's go to week four. And when I, as soon as I get to first John four, seven and eight, I'm transported back to the early eighties and late seventies in the black Hills at an outdoor ministry camp singing beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Is that outlaw? Uh, I yes, I, I used to go to the Atlantic Mountain Ranch uh, oh, piece okay. of that, but yes, outlaw ranch, Atlantic Mountain Ranch um, camp, uh, Wapagasset camp, uh, Onamia. Yeah, that's uh, these are uh, Bible camp songs uh, that I loved as a child. I don't think I can sing any of those, but uh, this um, this is a striking verse um, because love is used so uh, frequently in our language today. We like to talk about love, and um, sometimes our use of the word love is in exact opposite to what uh, this um entire first John is about. Um, we, we have used it to divide ourselves from, uh, from those who disagree with us on a variety of issues. And it makes this a very powerful text for us to speak to one another now, because the love of God is patient with us. As I've, as I've said before, when we turn our back on God and so I read this as, are we capable? No, because I think by the Spirit, we are capable. Are we willing to have that same type of patient generosity with folks uh, we see, folks that we journey with, who might not yet um, be living the way we think that they should? And what a difference it makes if we extend to them a patient love rather than uh, a critical, um, 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 what's the word I want to say? Punishment, but that's not the word I want to say. No, I think that's very powerful. And I think it, it goes powerfully with what the author of 1 John is trying to do here. And again, I've talked about the way that he's worked at coming at things from different angles to mm -hmm. try to help people see multiple facets of the same problem. And so one of the things that we know from the book of Deuteronomy and from the Gospels. And when Jesus is asked about the commandments, the commandments are often given in a twofold way, sometimes abbreviated as love God, love a neighbor. But both of those focus on the action of a person going out. That is, the individual believer directs their love towards God 
and directs their love towards mm-hmm. their neighbor. Mm-hmm. First John does this really interesting theory thing here in four where he reverses one of those directions mm-hmm. and instead says that love comes from God to the believer whereupon the believer can love their neighbor. And that it's that flow of love that God's care that is shown first is what allows love for the neighbor and not the other way around. I, I'm going to ask a heretical question if I might, go, but go ahead. You go first, Joy. No, I was just going to say, I really appreciated that in, in your uh, commentary here. Uh, just, just noting that um, it, it's why I, I couldn't say, are we capable? Because yes, it comes from God. We're capable. Are we surrendered to God enough for it to be evident in the world? But what's your heretical question, Rolf? Well, I don't. Um, C- C.S. Lewis had his book on uh, the various loves, agape, eros, um, storge, and philia. Mm-hmm. And in recent biblical scholarship, um, the distinction between these uh, has been um, largely poo pooed. Uh, and uh, but it is only consistently throughout this passage, uh, agape in either its nominal or verbal forms. And that does seem to me striking that it's only agape here. And I was just wondering if you uh, are a hermeneutic of suspicion regarding the poo-pooing of the, the different types of love. Well, I think it's with a lot of the things that we see in scholarship where, and especially, you know, C.S. Lewis was one of these scholars, but even more Anders Nigeren with his work Agape and Eros. And the difficulty is that he drew those distinctions so black and white and so sharply between Agape and Eros that the the reaction was inevitable. Mm-hmm. And I think with most things that there is, with any synonyms, there's always a choice that the author makes. And mm-hmm. the author has chosen in this particular case to emphasize Agape. How strongly we can say that there is a difference they see between that and philos, I'm a little bit ambivalent towards, but I do think that there is, it should be noted that they have made that choice here, that they did not have to only use agape. And so they're trying to get something across to their readers by making that choice. That's probably a good way to remind us uh, that whether we're talking about understanding from um, modern Enlightenment thinking that has um, its own um, correction of previous generations, and now we have a correction of that, um, that we are reading from a different culture. This is, we're reading across uh, understandings. And again, we must yield to the Spirit for uh, allowing us to come to an understanding that is as simple as possible for us to come together rather than as sophisticated as possible to divide us. All right, let's, let's go to week five. Um, and now we have another resonance uh, back with the Gospel of John. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Um, it was interesting, recently, um, uh, one of my friends has been asking me about the phrase uh, to be born anothen in John 3.16. And I talked to one of our colleagues, now retired, Craig Kester, who said uh, a scholar recently um, sh- uh, thoroughly went through every use of anothen in, that we have in Greek literature. And um, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, um, the word means from above. Mm. Uh, and it's only in secondary uh, meaning that it might mean again. Mm. Uh, but um, Can I tell you a goofy story about that, though? I want to hear it now. I love so, it. So here's the difficulty, right? And this is one of the criticisms of word studies is that they pile up lots and lots of uh, evidence. But the question is in this particular usage, so in the first century natural historian Claudius Aelianus, there is, he is, writes a lot like Aristotle does as well about fish. And one of the stories that he relates about fish is about sharks. And he relates the Greek belief that small sharks, after having been born, 
if they are faced with danger, will swim back into their mother's wombs, and then they will be born anothen <laughs> again after the danger has passed. So I don't know. There is a way in which the there is a possibility that there is a, Jesus is being a little bit um, playful with Nicodemus in oh, that yeah, respect. Um, so I think that there is some uh, some resonance there of these kinds of traditions. But, well, either way, uh, no matter what that means, it is clear here in First John five that, uh, but this point's already been made in the letter that the way you love God is to love his children. That is to love each other and to keep the commandments. And this is one of the, as a, as a student of the 10 commandments in the old Testament, um, the 10 commandments are the outline of what it looks like to love the neighbor. Absolutely. So to keep his commandments, you keep them not for your own sake, but as a way of loving the neighbor. And as um, Stanley Harwas and Will Willimon would say, um, we keep the commandments as a way of worshiping God. So this love of neighbor is actually a way of serving God. Just to sneak two more Methodists into into the conversation among my favorites. Fell out of my mouth. Uh, fell out of my mouth. <laughs> just right. Just right there. It is beautiful, right? It is true. It is. It All is. Right, let's let's go to the last week. People are cheering. Yay, they're finally at the last week. Uh, <laughs> could I throw in a, a, a short story that oh. just might be a, a illustration yeah. for someone with this uh, idea of loving the parent? Um, I, I, um, I want to attribute this to Sam Wells when he was dean of the chapel at Duke. I'm not sure. But um, uh, it, he, he told the story of uh, a kid working all day long to draw a picture. And uh, in the midst of drawing that picture, uh, uh, you can't tell what it is, but it gets hung up on the um, refrigerator and acknowledged as being the absolute most phenomenal piece of art ever. And it's not because the artwork is precious, but it's because the creator is precious. And uh, th that that idea, and as I say that, it, it wasn't Sam Wells that did that. It was um, a laywoman uh, from North Carolina uh, whose name is escaping me right now. But um, uh, the, the, the idea is that um, everything that we do in the world is our demonstration of our love of God. And so when we love our neighbor, we are um, pointing to the creator's creation, even when we might not understand that neighbor. I do want to thank you for that story, Joy. I do want to walk back a slight comment that I made. The word in the shark story is Alphys, about being born again. So I take it back. It was I love how we have to check our bills. <laughs> well, yeah. Even so, the point that just because if 99% of the uses mean one thing doesn't mean that that one can't be the 1%. So mm -hmm. it's still a helpful, uh, it's still a helpful point, but I'm, I'm glad you fact checked yourself because all of those Greek nerds out there we're, were going already to writing. I know. I don't want them to have to get their knives out. So I <laughs> checked it for myself. So this is um, the last reading. Um, what's the, where and what's the preachable point here in this last uh, week six from your I'm gonna perspective? Go, I'm going to go with verse 11. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life. And this life is in the son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. And in that, I'm going to go back to uh, the gospel of John. What is life? but to know God and the one whom God has sent. How do we know God but through the Son of God? How do we understand God but in that we've seen what God in the flesh looks like in Jesus? And um, so eternal life not as um, 
something we get pie in the sky when we die. You know, you've heard me say that over and over again. But eternal life as the privilege and joy of knowing the Creator and the Creator's intention for the world demonstrated in the person of Jesus Christ, who we as a community seek individually to be like, little Christian. I'd also point out one thing. This may not be a problem in your tradition, Joy, but I've noticed this is a problem with our students and uh, in the tradition that I come from and that Rolf comes from, which is the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. One thing that makes people uncomfortable is testimony. The (laughs) idea that one should be able to give testimony of their faith in Jesus. And there's one takeaway from for me from this is the importance of testimony, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the testimony is not an abstract principle you can appeal to, is not a philosophical proof that you can make. It's what God has done for you in your life through Christ Jesus. And this is where this is where John ends this with testimony. And that is really where the, you know, to use the phrase where the proof in the pudding is, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is in the testimony that God gives through Jesus. I would close us then with one word, testify. Amen. Amen.